So uh, we did the derivation in different ways um, using material systems and then material elements, which are fluid particles, and then using a finite size control volume and then a differential control volume. The difference being um, an integral versus a differential form. And you can go, go back and forth between the two. And we discussed how the Reynolds transport theorem and the material derivative are two sides of the same coin. Essentially, the material derivative is the Reynolds transport theorem in differential form applied at for a material point or a fluid particle. Um, and, and we left off with this specific derivation doing the conservation of mass for a fluid particle. And you don't see the, this form um, often in textbooks. Um, so I thought uh, it would be nice for you to see it. Uh, and I'm just going to go through it very quickly. So the mass of the idea of conservation of mass is that the mass of a material point of a fluid particle does not change with time. So the rate of change, the material derivative of the mass of the fluid particle is zero. Okay? And we discussed why we only see time rates of change in Lagrangians in, for the fundamental conservation laws, because the space doesn't, the, the, can be expressed as a function of time. So the differential mass for a material point is delta m. That's rho times delta v. Rho is the density and intensive property. So it doesn't matter what size um, of material you take. It's always going to have the same density. But delta, delta v, that's what's going to change. So the conservation of mass, the law for conservation of mass, says that the rate of change of this differential mass doesn't change in time. So if we take this and do a chain rule over here, d or, or just split the derivative, d rho delta v by dt, um, you, you know, it's u prime v plus v prime u. So that's delta v d rho dt plus rho d delta v by dt. And many will immediately assume that d delta v by dt is equal to 0. That is not the case. That is only the case for an incompressible flow. But in general, that's not the case. And we can show that the rate of change of the um, material, the volume of the material element is related to the dilatation. Now, remember, we said um, div u, the dilatation, that's the integral of u dot n ds. If div u is positive, there is mass coming out. If div u is negative, there is mass coming in. And so the, the, the volume, the, the rate of change of the volume, yeah, of course, is going to be related to the dilatation. If, if you allow mass to come in, that volume is going to try to expand, right? And if you allow vo material to leave, um, that volume is going to shrink, OK? So that you can see how this is directly related to div u. And then when you do the substitutions, you get the generic, the standard um, uh, continuity equation or conservation of mass equation. This is in Eulerian form, OK? You see the rate of change pointwise and this um, um, divergence of rho u, OK? Now, for an incompressible flow, the condition for incompressible flow, in mechanical engineering, those who have a mechanical engineering background, maybe industrial engineering or civil engineering, you will often hear or read in, in fluid textbooks that the density is constant for an incompressible flow. That is not correct. That is not correct. An incompressible flow, by definition, is when a material element or a material point does not change volume. It can, it can change shape, but the volume does not change. I'll give you an example. Water and oil. Imagine you have a bunch of droplets of water, a bunch of droplets of oil, and you put them in a balloon and you shake the balloon. They're going to move around, right? But they're not going to, so you have a density field. The density is not constant in the balloon. You have density of water. You have density of oil at different points, right? But the flow is incompressible because you're not expanding the, the, the bubbles the, or the, 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 um, um, uh, the uh, yes, the bubbles or the droplets of water and the droplets of oil. So that flow is incompressible, but there is a density variation. Because at any point in the balloon, you could have either oil or water, and that density is not constant. So the, the idea that density is that incompressible flow means constant density is not correct. Okay, it means constant density um, in an Eulerian sense. The condition for incompressible flow is that d delta v by dt is zero. That is, the volume of these fluid elements does not change. They can move around. They can change shape. OK, uh, maybe they can split, but the volume does not really change to ex expand or compress. So that directly implies that the dilatation is 0. 
There's no mass coming in, there's no mass leaving. Okay? And that's the Eulerian version of this um, Lagrangian condition. Now, you take that and put it back in the continuity equation. Now, remember this continuity equation. We have d rho dt plus div rho u. Div rho u, you can split it into rho div u plus u dot grad rho. Okay? So if you set div u equal to 0, this implies that only d rho by dt is equal to 0. So the material rate of change of the density is 0. But in Eulerian form, the density can change in space because, so in mechanical or industrial or civil engineering, they tell you that rho is constant, right? What that implies is that d rho by dt is 0 and um, grad rho is 0. But that's not an incompressible flow. That is a constant density flow. An incompressible flow only means that div u is 0, which implies that d rho by dt is 0, which implies that the combination d rho by dt plus u dot grad rho is equal to 0. But this guy is not necessarily 0, neither is this guy. And you'll often see in your CFD calculations, you'll hear the word multiphase incompressible flow. So if you're doing a flow with oil and water, you're trying to do in some emulsification process, or you're just trying to kind of scrub oil and whatever. Your condition, in that is an incompressible flow. So your condition is div u equals 0, but the density is not constant. Okay, The density in space, you're going to have a density for water and density for oil. So keep that in mind. Okay. Now, for constant density flows, where rho is constant everywhere in time and space, so you have a flow of a single component. You have just water, or you have you know, air at very low speeds. Then you could say that the density is constant everywhere. And that still implies div u equals 0. And it also implies 0 dt equals 0 and grad rho equals 0. OK? Just keep that in mind. All right. The next great conservation law that we're going to um, apply to a uh, fluid element or fluid particle is Newton's conservation, Newton's second law. That's the law of conservation of momentum, and that tells you that the rate of change of momentum is equal to the summation of forces acting on the object or the element. Um, and I kept this in conservation form, so I kept, oftentimes you see mdv by dt equals summation of forces. I kept it as dmv by dt equals summation of forces, okay? just to stay um, as general as possible. OK, so which fluid model should we use for Newton's law? OK, last time we saw we could do you know, the fluid system versus fluid particle, control volume, finite control volume. Um, in introductory fluids, you see in the first one of the first few chapters, you see they apply the integral form, but oftentimes, they apply the integral form only to get the, the left-hand side of the momentum equation and to deduce what the forces are, the right-hand side. Because the forces are difficult to understand in the integral form. You know, we're going to be talking about stresses and stress forces and pressure forces. So, so the integral form, I, I like to use it to do integral analysis of fluid systems. So for example, you have a water hose and you open the water and that there's a water jet. What is the force that is um, uh, exercised by the water jet on you or on the hose? So you do an integral analysis. You take a control volume you know, around the hose. You see what's coming out and what's going in. And you, you, that momentum, the difference in momentum, they give you the summation of forces on the right-hand side. You don't have to worry about what those forces are. You just say, hey, the total force is this. Okay, So that's the benefit of the integral form, in my opinion. But if we want to get to an Eulerian description, a uh, differential form, I think it's better to apply Newton's law on a fluid particle. Uh, and we could equally apply it on a finite control, uh, an infinitesimal control volume. So that's fixed in space, Eulerian. Both are the same. Today I'm going to, you know, I'm feeling that I want to do it on a fluid particle. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated, but, you know, I'm going to do it that way. Okay. So remember, we are dealing with three components of momentum or of velocity. So we call that the velocity vector 
u in bold face that consists of u, v, and w. u in the x direction, v in the y direction, and w in the z direction. Okay? Momentum for a fluid system, uh, there's a typo here. Okay, this should be p, momentum for a fluid system, so that's a finite size collection of fluid particles, is the total mass of the fluid system, or the integral in reality, um, um, of u delta m. So there's a typo here. I'll fix it before I publish this. Okay, so this really is p is equal to the integral of u delta m. That's the total momentum in a fluid system. The momentum, therefore, for a fluid particle is delta p. It's a vector. And that's equal to u delta m. Remember, everything is based on this delta m, the mass of the fluid particle. And the mass is rho delta v, so you get um, the momentum for a fluid particle is rho u delta v. Okay? And simply, Newton's second law says that dp by dt is summation of forces. In this case, the rate of change, material derivative, think, because this is a fluid element, del delta p by, de by dt is equal to summation of forces. OK, so now we're going to focus on this left-hand side. We're going to see what it looks like. And, and if, you know, if, you've done, if you've gone through the previous few slides, you can immediately spit out what this is going to look like. And then we're going to focus what go, on what goes into the right-hand side. OK, so d delta p, if you want to follow with me this way, we can kind of go through it step by step together. OK, so d delta p, again, this is vector, but I'm going to drop the um, vector symbol next. So that's equal to d rho u vector delta m by dt. And again, we're going to do a split here. And the split, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, I'm going to keep momentum inside the derivative, because that's what we're trying to track. We want to write this for momentum, right? And I'm going to take, um, I'm going to split this derivative with respect to um, dv. So this is delta v, right? So that's going to be um, delta v d rho u by dt plus rho u d delta v by dt. Okay. Now, again, we're going to do the same procedure of replacing d del delta v by delta t with um, delta v div u. So that gives us delta v d rho u by dt plus rho u delta v div u. Okay. Great. So we have we can factor out delta v. And we have d rho u by dt plus rho u div u. Okay, one more step. Delta v times what is d rho u by dt? That's partial rho u by partial t plus u dot grad rho u. Be careful, these are all vectors. Okay, we're taking the gradient of a vector. So that's really um, a tensor, okay? But then dotted with a vector is going to give us a vector. Now remember, this is a vector equation, okay? U dot grad rho u plus rho u div u. Now, what will that, I'm going to combine these two guys, what will that give us? That is going to give us. What? Or actually, the divergence div u rho u. So that is div vector a b. Okay, that's going to be a dot grad b plus b div a. Okay, that's a dyadic. So when you have two vectors next to each other, it's a dyadic, or in other words, it's a tensor. So that's a matrix. Um, and, but I'll show you a way to kind of how to think of this, okay? And I'm going to show that on the slides. Okay? Now, the key point here is to remember what is the quantity for which you are tracking the rate of change, okay? So that's momentum, that's rho u, okay? And everything else is auxiliary. So, I want you to think of this velocity u as something different than rho u. 
rho u is momentum, okay? Momentum per unit volume, right? And u is just the velocity field. So think of these two things separately. So when you see u rho u, don't say this is u squared. This u is something different than rho u because this law could apply equally to another vector, div u b, some other quantity you may be tracking. Maybe there's magnetism involved and something weird going on. Okay? Now, in, in mechanical and chemical engineering um, tradition, we call this the advecting velocity, okay? And we call that the advected quantity, okay? So in general, in general, when you see something that looks like div u times another quantity phi, could be a vector, you say that this is the advecting velocity or advective velocity, advective velocity, and this is the advected quantity. Okay. What is advection? That being said, and I was going to discuss advection a little bit later, but since we're at it, what is advection? Or what is convection or advection? OK. So let's say I am burning incense over here. All right? And there's absolutely you're all quiet. No one is moving. We're like all frozen. There's no motion of air in this room. And I'm burning incense over here. Are you going to smell it immediately? Probably not. It's going to take a minute, right? So how would I make this incense, how would I make you smell this incense, incense almost instantly? Yes, there you go. I can stand behind it and blow or put a fan. That is advection. Advection is using the bulk macroscopic motion of a gas or a fluid to move something from one point to another. That's advection. If you remember Tom and Jerry, I don't know how old you are, but if you remember Tom and Jerry, there's this famous episode where the lady cooks this pie and she puts it on the, on the window and then you see this smell, you know, um, gradient thing, and then Tom smells it and follows it. So that's advection. That's really advection. And mathematically, the mechanism of advection is described by this formula, div u times phi. U is the thing that is moving the quantity phi. Phi could be concentration of incense, concentration of Tom and Jerry's pie, or it could be momentum, okay? Or it could be mass. Now, if you look at the continuity equation, continuity equation, what is being advected here? Is this an advection term? Yes, it's an advection term. U is advecting mass per unit volume, that's density. So that's an advection term, okay? In this case, what's being advected is rho u, okay? So you're advecting a vector quantity. Over here, you're advecting a scalar quantity. So you're advecting density in that one? Yes, or mass per unit volume. Pardon me? Velocity, yeah, and rho is the advected quantity. So advector and advecti, uh, you know, if you, if you want to think about it that way, okay? Yeah, yeah. In other words, you know, what is moving, what is the field that is moving this guy? That's given by this velocity field, that's the vector field. Could be something something else. Yeah. Yes. 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 In this case, what's so interesting about the Navier-Stokes equations is that now in reality, of course, rho u and u are related. U is equal to rho u over rho, right? They are related. Numerically, they may not be the same. U may not be equal to rho u over over rho because of different numerical errors. But at least mathematically, u is rho u over Rho. And if you think about it, it's like momentum advecting itself 
or the fluid advecting itself. Okay? Now, there's a reason I write this in red, because I want to show you next how we can. This is actually three equations, right? Because you have three momentum directions, okay? Delta Px, delta Py, delta Pz. And so let's let's look at how these look like. So this is the vector form. But again, when you see div rho u u, be think about this. And another way to 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 kind of recognize this is okay, what is what is inside the the partial derivative here? Rho u. So you gotta pick a rho u here, and then there's this u that is advecting everything. Now, how do you convert this into three components, x, y, and z? This is where the importance of distinguishing rho u u comes in. So in the x direction, okay, forget about this term for a second. In the x direction, we're going to pick up rho u x, right, or rho u. So that's the first component of the u vector. So that's rho u. Now what do you do with this term? You have div rho u u. Do you pick the first element of each? No. You pick the first element of rho u, which is rho u, and then you keep that other vector. So now you can see how rho u, the x component of momentum, is being moved around by all, th all three velocity components. Another sanity check, this equation is a scalar equation, right? Because this is a scalar, d rho u by dt is a scalar. So this guy should be a scalar. Is it a scalar? Yes, because the divergence of a vector is a scalar. Okay, so this operation is partial by partial x rho u u plus partial by partial x rho u v plus partial by partial, uh, partial y plus partial by partial z rho u w. Is this clear? Do you want me to just spell it out, Aaron? Yes, yes, yes. And the same thing is going to happen for the y component of momentum. We're going to pick the second element of u, so that's going to be rho v. But what do you do with this guy? You just pick the second element of the momentum, which is rho v, and then it's acted upon by the entire velocity vector. Okay? And same thing for the z component. Okay? So, so this form can be confusing. Like, what do you do with this guy? In the end, you're going to implement it, do something like this when you implement it. But this is so easy to write down because it's compact, right? So we write it in this form. But don't let it mislead you, OK? Oh, I understand the, uh, is, uh, a it is a tensor or a dyadic. Yeah. 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 But yeah, you can still think of it as a tensor because each velocity, you're, you're advecting a vector. A vector is advecting a vector, right? right? So you're going to end up with a tensor. OK? So in this case, the dyadic is equal to the tensor rho u u. OK? And that tensor is going to be, so if you want, so rho u u is going to be equal to, so vector vector is going to be equal to rho u u, rho u v, rho u w. And then you're going to have rho v u, rho v v, rho v w, rho w u, rho w v, rho w w. Okay? Or you take the transpose, whichever you like. But anyway, this is just the, think of this intuitively, man. Okay? Don't let the math blind you. Okay? It's just a notation. The math is just a notation to simplify things. Okay. So this is the left hand side. Okay, great. We now have the Eulerian version of the three components of momentum. Now we need to figure out what we're going to put in these forces. Okay? So in general, you know, over the centuries, we figured out what acts on a fluid particle. And we summarize those by surface and body forces. Okay? Body forces, what are body forces? They are forces that act on the entire mass or entire volume of the body, OK? So what's a body force that is acting on us right now? Oh, wait, yes, gravity, right? So that's a body force. It's, it results in this weight pulling us all down, OK? So we're going to start with body forces because they're the easiest. So on a fluid particle, 
If you imagine you have a field of body forces given by delta F, um, in this case, I'm going to give the example of delta F for gravity acting on a infinitesimal mass delta M, then the force of gravity is delta M times G as a vector because, you know, um, G could, you could have acceleration in, in all three directions. So not necessarily just the gravity of the Earth. You could have acceleration if you're you know, flying into space and moving around, right? So you could have acceleration in all three directions. But it's pretty simple. You know, the force um, in the x direction, that's rho gx times delta v, rho gy delta v, and rho gz delta v. Same thing for all other bo body forces. They're typically conservative forces. So, um, you know, they can be written in this, uh, all in this form. It's pretty straightforward. Okay? Is this clear? So if you only have, if you, if you take the z direction as the vertical direction on Earth, then these guys are going to be zero, and this guy is going to be minus 9.81. Okay? Don't forget, this is a signed value. Okay. Now on to the more important piece, piece of the forces, and those are the surface forces. So um, I know you don't all have a background in, in, in continuum mechanics, and so we're not going to dig deep into this, but you're going to have to take some of this for granted. And if you want to dig deeper, you know, I can send you material for you to dig deeper, but you can keep digging and digging and, and end up getting lost in the digging. Um, but I'm going to present the mechanical description of um, the surface forces. There's also a chemical engineering um, description of the surface forces, and they're actually not treated as forces. Rather, they're treated as diffusion, diffusive, diffusion of momentum. Okay? And we have, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but on any surface, on an arbitrary surface, forget about the fluid um, particle for a minute now. Take any surface in a fluid. Um, you're going to have a net force acting on that fluid due to the fluid above it, the fluid around it, whatever's going on. So if I'm sitting on this table, there's going to be you know, a reaction force inside this table. If I take a slice through it, there may be all sorts of weird forces going on. If I take another slice, there will be maybe a force vector. But that force factor can be decomposed into three components aligned with a coordinate direction or aligned with the surface. We can distinguish a vertical or a normal component of the force, that's delta Fm, okay? And we can distinguish two forces that are tangential to the surface, okay? And those are delta F1 and delta F2. Now these forces, the F1 and F2, we call those shear forces. Because you know, if, you, if you put your hand on this table and you move in this direction or that direction, that's called shear. That's called shearing, right? So we call these shear forces. And the normal forces, they can be compressive or tensile. Okay? They can be pushing or pulling upward. Okay? Now, in the limit as the area on which these forces act, um, in the limit as this area shrinks, we're going to end up with something called a stress. That's essentially force per unit area in the limit as the area shrinks to zero. And we're going to call the normal stress sigma n or tau n, if you want. And the other two stresses, the other two shear stresses, tau 1 and tau 2. OK, so that's great. That's for an arbitrary surface. But now let's take a fluid element that looks like a cube. Now, on each of those surfaces, okay, you're going to have a force vector. And that also means you're going to have a stress, three stress components on each of those surfaces. Now, there's this theorem, a Cauchy theorem, that says, you know, to describe the state of stress at any point, you only need the force vectors on three mutually perpendicular plates. Essentially, so so in other words, you know, I'm sitting on this table. If I take a slice in this direction, I'm going to have a force vector that's pointing that way. If I take a slice in another direction, I'm going to have a force vector pointing in another another way. So at a point, you have an infinite amount of vectors that can describe the state of of tension or stress in this table. But there is a theorem that says if you only describe it in three mutually perpendicular perpendicular planes. That's enough to describe all other states. So we're going to take that for granted and move forward. But 
Another way to think about it, if you take a, a fluid element that looks like this, well, you're going to have forces you know, on this, this surface, forces on that surface, forces on the other surface, and also forces on the other side as well. Okay? But that, that being said, we need a mechanism, to, a nomenclature, to name these stresses. Okay? So in a coordinate system that is x, y, z, and I forgot to put that on the slide, so I'm going to put it here. In a coordinate system, so take a right-handed, so x, y, let me see, what did I, I keep, yep, I did the, okay. A, we're going to call, if you have a plane perpendicular to the x-axis, we're going to call this an x-plane. Okay. If you have a plane perpendicular to the y-axis, we're going to call that a y-plane. And if you have a plane perpendicular to the z-axis, so this is x-plane, y-plane, this is z-plane. Okay. If you have a plane perpendicular to the z-axis, we're going to call that a z-plane. Okay, so now that gives us the definition of the planes. Now on each of those planes, we're going to have three stresses. One normal stress and two shear stresses. So it makes sense to give them a nomenclature. We're going to call the state of stress on this element tau ij. What do the indices mean? The first index indicates the face, and the second index indicates the direction, right? Because there could be shearing in the vertical direction, shearing in the horizontal direction, right? So tau xx is the stress acting on the x face in the x direction. Tau xy, so on this plane, this is tau xx, okay? What is tau xy? So tau xy is acting on an x face, so this is the face, in the y direction. So this is tau xy. What is tau yx? Y plane. So what is the y plane? This is the y plane. Uh huh. In the x direction. Tau yx. What is tau zy? Z plane in the y direction. Tau zy. And so on and so forth. Okay? So in total, we're going to have nine of these components okay, to describe the state of stress on a fluid element. Okay. Enough with this nomenclature. There's a lot of literature in this. It is true. It works, you know, and, and it does great things. But let's now, so, so now we have components in all directions, and we have three momentum equations, one in the x, one in the y, one in y in the z direction. We're trying to get the surface forces for each direction. So first, we're going to focus on doing the momentum for the x direction. OK, let's get all the forces in the x direction. So we already got the gravity force. That's rho g x delta v. Now we're going to look at the stress forces. So again, we're going to take this differential fluid element. OK? In the middle, imagine we have in the middle a state of stress, sigma, sigma x x. Um, and sigma yx and sigma zx, right? Because everything is going to be in the x direction. So the last index in the stress tensor is going to have x in it. Does that make sense? So we're only picking the components that are acting on the element in the x direction. So those are the x forces, OK? So that's why you see sigma xx and then tau yx and then uh, tau zx, only the components in the x direction. Okay, and then we do the same thing we did last time with Taylor series. Okay, to the left of this differential element, you're going to have sigma xx minus a rate of change, d sigma xx by dx times the spacing plus higher order terms, which are going to disappear. Same thing on the right face for sigma xx. Now, what about tau yx? You have the same thing in the y direction. And tau zx, same thing. So this is tau z because this is the z phase, the z plane, right? Same thing for tau zx. You're going to have tau zx in the plus direction, so tau zx plus d tau zx, and tau zx minus d tau zx, okay? 
So what do you do in the x direction? You just sum all the forces in the x direction. And after you sum all those up, you just end up with this very simple, benign looking formula. Partial sigma xx by partial x plus partial tau yx by partial y plus partial tau zx by partial z, right? So, so these are all the stresses in the x direction. So this is the summation of forces in the x direction. In the y direction, for the y momentum, you're going to get the same thing, except you're going to pick the other components, all the components that go in the y direction. Can you imagine how this would apply in the y direction? Just flip it around, OK? Flip the arrows in the vertical direction, OK? And same thing in the z direction. Now, we haven't said anything about what's inside of these guys. Don't worry about that. We're going to get to this later. But now we know that if there, these forces that exist on a, that operate on a fluid particle, they look like this, OK? Don't worry what goes inside these guys. We're going to derive that in a second. We're going to show what they look like in a second. So finally, for the x-momentum equation, that's d del p x by dt. We saw how the left what the left-hand side looks like. d rho u by dt, that's the x component of momentum, plus div rho u u vector equal rho g x delta v, don't forget the delta v, plus this derivative of the stress, um, the stresses in the x direction. Okay, you can call sigma x x tau y x tau z x vector t x, and this would be a diversion strain. Okay, but then you simplify with delta v, and you get the x momentum equation. This is it. This is our first step towards the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, the only thing that's missing is a specification for what these guys are. Okay, and same thing for the y and z component of momentum. And in general, the fluid flow equations, not just the, not the Navier Stokes, the Navier Stokes are specific for a Newtonian fluid and constant, and constant viscosity, constant density flow. Okay, or just a Newtonian fluid with a constant density flow. Those are the Navier Stokes. But in general, the fluid flow equations or the gas dynamics equations. They're given by these four equations, a conservation of mass equation, and a momentum equation, a momentum balance equation, Newton's second law for each momentum component. Okay. And over uh, the next lectures, over the semester, the course of the semester, we're going to beat these into our heads so that you just can spit them out without even thinking about them to recognize what goes into each of these equations, OK? Now, I like to write things. We all like to write things in compact form. I like to use a vector form or a combination of vector and tensor notation. For the continuity equation, we saw how this can be written as 0 dt plus div rho u equals 0. So that is a scalar equation. Okay, You have to always remember, what is, what is this? Is it going to give you a vector or a scalar? It's a scalar equation because the divergence vector field is a scalar, so that is a scalar equation. Okay, for the momentum equations, you can do one of several things. Um, one of the easiest things, you know, to grasp is to say, okay, so I'm gonna collect the x components of the stress tensor of the stresses into a vector, a net vector called a Tx, so that contains tau xx or sigma xx. I'm swapping nomenclatures, okay? You'll see this throughout the literature, so that's on purpose, not a typo, because you, you don't want that, that to confuse you. So tau xx, tau yx, tau dx, those are all the net, um, all the stresses in the x direction, and then the stress, the resultant of the stress force acting on the fluid element is div tx, right? So you agree that div tx is partial tau xx by partial x plus partial tau yx partial y plus partial tau zx by partial z, and that's this guy, okay? So all I did was collect these guys into a vector, okay? Same thing in the y direction, same thing in the z direction. You can even go further, and so, so we still have three equations here. 
we know how to combine these terms into vector form. That's d rho u vector. We know how to combine these into vector form. That's div rho u vector times u vector. We know how to combine these into vector form. There's still this guy. The problem is that this guy is a tensor, so it needs to look like something like this, OK? So what you can do is take, define a tensor, tau ij. That's our original definition. And then put these three vectors into what looks like a matrix, essentially. Okay, and then your momentum equation looks like this. Let me explain. This is you're probably never gonna see this in any textbook, and I've you know I've had my share of argument with um, reviewers in the literature about why I like this form. But let me justify it for you for a minute. What I'm doing here, I'm doing d rho u i by d t. That index, i, is going to go 1, 2, 3. So u1 is the first component of velocity. u2 is the second component. And u3 is the third component. OK, you agree? That's d rho u i by dt. Plus diff rho u i times u vector. OK, so now you say, OK, I want to get the equation for the y direction. So I'm going to put i equal to, so that gives you rho v, and that automatically gives you rho v over here. And you know that u is a vector, so great, we got these, these two terms, okay? E equal rho g i, so really i is the direction, right? So in this case, rho g y, plus div of tau i. What is tau i? That is the vector t in the direction you're interested in. So in this case, t2 or ty, that's going to be this guy. Pop, pop, pop. OK? Just one other way to write it. I am not particularly fond of tensor derivatives and notation. They can get really confusing. And honestly, the way the Navier-Stokes equations are written in tensor form, you rather than ending up with d tau x x dx plus d tau y x dy, you end up with d tau x x dx plus d tau x y dy, which is technically wrong. Numerically, that's wrong. Because although in the infinitesimal limit tau x y and tau y x are equal because of rotational um, um, balance. Numerically, they are not. Numerically, you have discrete locations for what all of these components mean. So you have to be true and honest in what component of the stress tensor you put in here. Okay? So that's just one other form. Okay? You will also see this form, d rho u dt plus minus div u rho u plus div tau plus rho f. Go figure how you extract div tau. If you know how to do it, great. You know, good for you. OK. Yes? So yes, point-wise, but numerically, right. where do you compute these, com these elements? You will see that numerically, they're not going to be equal, because you're going to be getting different. So once, once we dis describe the stress tensor, the way you calculate these components, even at the same point, they're not going to be equal, because the derivatives are just all over the place, OK? <clears throat> OK, so what's in a stress tensor? Um, you know, I, I cannot derive this for you, because we would need to do experiments and, and you know, take us a lifetime to do this. But you know, people have been doing this for centuries. And for Newtonian fluids, so these are fluids where the so, so in, in continuum mechanics, and, and maybe you, you can help us, you can explain this to us better because you're in, in continuum mechanics. Um, you know, when you, when you try to put a force on an object, you are straining the object, and you're causing small displacements in the object. Now, these displacements can be related, in general, to the force that you are exerting. And that makes sense, right? If I push something harder, it's going to bend more, 
right? So there's a direct relation between the force or the stress that I'm putting on the point and the displacement of that point. Newtonian fluids tell you that the displacement caused by a stress is related linearly to that stress. So you double the force, you're going to double the displacement, okay, or proportionally, okay? So we're going to be dealing with Newtonian fluids. If you want to use a non-Newtonian fluid, so take I don't know, paint, for example, um, or, or um, I don't know if you've seen these um, videos where they mix cor corn starch with water, whatever, and they can run over it, on it, and then it suddenly breaks and collapses. That's a non-Newtonian fluid. You simply have to change the relation here between the stress tensor and the displacement. What are these guys here? They're just displacements. They're related to the displacement of fluid elements. But in general, the stress tensor, tau ij, is minus p delta ij. What is p? We forget about the pressure. That is a pressure force. Why do we have a pressure force embedded in the stress tensor? Well, to cover the case of a fluid that is not moving. A fluid that is not moving has only compressive stresses on it, has only compressive pain on it. And that is described by the pressure. That's a scalar. You know, It doesn't have a direction. The gradient has a direction. But that a pressure acts in all directions, essentially. Okay? So we embed the pressure here. And it's only a normal force. Okay, it's only a compressive force, all right? Yeah, it, it is not a body force. The pressure is force per unit area, right? And that acts on the surface, okay? And this second component here, now, ij notation, just, you know, put i and j here. So tau xx, that's tau 1, 1. You put 1, 1, 1, 1, and you can get the formula, okay? Put tau 1, 2 or tau 2, 1, and you can get the formula for these guys. Just a simple um, substitution. But this mu, du i dx j plus du j dx i, this describes essentially the resistance exercised by the fluid viscosity. So fluids have different viscosities. They are, viscosity is a measure of the resistance to motion. So for example, honey has a higher viscosity than water. Oil has higher viscosity than water. Water has higher viscosity than air. So this essentially describes the ability of a fluid or a gas to resist motion. And this thing here is very debatable. It's, a, um, it's something you, you know, we all use. No, no one knows how true this is. But we know that for incompressible flows, this guy is zero. What is duk by dxk? using Einstein notation, that's du by dx plus dv dy plus dw dz. So you probably haven't seen this before. That's the first and last time you're going to see this. When you see a repeated index in the same term, it implies a summation, OK, over all the possible values of the index. I can probably just change this and write it as div u, OK? So this is div u, dilatation, OK? For incompressible fluids, this is zero, so we don't have to worry about this. Okay. Now, what is delta ij? It's called the Kronecker delta. If i and j are equal, then delta ij is one. Otherwise, it's zero. So you can see now that the pressure is only going to show up when i and j are equal. And what ha what is ij i equal j? That's a normal stress. So the pressure is only going to show up on the normal components of the stress. So tau xx that's minus p plus you know, 2 mu du by dx minus 2 third mu dv. You can see this guy here. Okay? So those are the normal stresses. And the same thing for all the shear stresses. Okay? That's what's in a normal stress. So what you do, you take these and put them back in the Navier-Stokes equations. But we're going to look at some special cases. First special case, inviscid flow. What is an inviscid flow? And do inviscid flows exist in reality? Are you sure? What about the winds on the planet Uranus? The winds, the high winds on the planet Uranus that is supercooled. The atmosphere of the planet Uranus is supercooled to the extent that viscosity is vanishingly zero. And given the initial rotation of the planet, 
those winds are still spinning at hundreds of kilometers per hour. And they're going to be doing that for, you know, until we, until the universe probably blows up. Okay? So, invisit fluids are fluids where viscosity is vanishingly small. Okay? There's no, there's practically no resistance um, to motion. Okay? They are an idealization of real fluids. They, are, they rarely happen in nature. But you can approximate, for example, portions of the atmosphere as inviscid. They are very cold, so viscosity typically decreases with temperature. So in the upper atmosphere, the atmosphere is cold. The viscosity can be vanishingly small. And we can, in reality, actually approximate certain regions of fluids as inviscid. Okay? But they are an idealized version of fluid flow because they simplify things a lot. So essentially what happens, this entire piece of the stress tensor disappears. And you are only left with the pressure. So what ends up happening, you get what are called the Euler equations. So those are the fluid flow equations with zero viscosity. Okay? Density is still variable. Okay? Another special case. Viscous constant density flow. So we have viscosity. Viscosity is non-zero. But you have a constant density. So div u is equal to zero. Then this guy simplifies, disappears. But also there's going to be a simplification for this term, which is going to be on, one, on your next homework, um, which I'll hopefully give to you next Tuesday. So essentially, what happens to this guy when you expand it and take div u equals zero? This guy simplifies significantly as well. OK? OK. Now, this is great, but something is still missing. We have five unknowns. We don't know what the density is, correct? So we have rho, unknown, u, v, and w, unknown. So we have four unknowns and the pressure, OK? But how many equations do we have? We have continuity, one, two, three momentum equations. So we have five unknowns, four equations. And if you remember your math, that is an ill-posed problem. So we still need one more equation. And this is where physical insight comes in. So in general, for gas dynamics flows, um, we need one additional equation for the density. Okay? We need an equation for the density or the pressure. And where does that come from? It comes from thermodynamics. And that's the state of a gas that essentially relates one thermodynamic quantity to two other thermodynamic quantities. So P as a function of the density and the temperature, or the density as a function of the pressure and the temperature, whichever specification you like. So that gives you an equation of state, but that introduces another variable. So let's say you're going to pick your thermodynamic quantities as the density and temperature. Okay, so you, given density and temperature, you can find the pressure. But what is temperature? So we need one equal more equation for the temperature. And there's one conservation law that we haven't invoked yet. What is that? Energy, conservation of energy. Okay. So this is the last of the great conservation laws that we're going to cover. I'm going to go, I'm going to breeze through this very quickly because there are so many forms of the energy equation. And for this class, we're only going to be dealing with a very simplified version for the Euler equations. But even initially, we're not going to be dealing with the energy equation at all. And we'll discuss why um, um, later. But to, to make things complete, Second, the, the first law of thermodynamics says that the change in internal energy of a system or the total energy of a system, so if you have a system that's moving, you have kinetic energy on top of internal energy, is equal to Q dot minus W dot. What is Q dot? That's the rate of heating. And W dot, that is the rate of work. Now, what do these signs mean? Okay. Q dot is the rate of, so when heat is added to the system, you're going to increase its energy, right? So it makes sense to put a positive sign on this guy. So dE by dt, if heat is positive, dE by dt is going to increase. If heat is, if you are taking heat out of the system, the energy of the system is going to decrease. So you're going to reduce its state, right? You're cooling it, essentially. Um, so what happens? This guy is negative. Now minus w, and this is from a, I mean, there are different ways of describing this. But as long as we are consistent, we should be, okay, so the, the notation I'm taking here um, is that W dot is positive, the rate of work is positive when 
the system is doing work on the outside, okay? So, but when the system does work on the outside, it has to furnish energy somehow. So it has to take from its own internal energy, turn it into work, and lose that. So that's why you have a negative sign here. So work done by a system is positive, but that means that the internal energy is going to decrease, so we multiply it by a negative sign. So that if W dot is positive, system is doing work, therefore its internal energy is decreasing, so we need to have a negative sign. And the opposite is true when work is being done on the system, so you're furnishing, you're giving the system energy, then W dot is negative, multiplied by a negative sign, that makes it positive, and DE by DT increases. Okay, so now we're gonna use the Reynolds transport theorem. The extensive property is the total energy, M u hat, which is internal energy, plus half M u squared, because the system is moving, and then the intensive property is the total energy per unit mass, we're gonna call this E sub, um, sub zero, okay? So the Reynolds transport theorem tells us that the rate of change, the integral of the control volume, fixed control volume, of rho E zero dV, plus the fluxes, the net fluxes of rho E zero through the surfaces of the control volume, are equal to Q minus W dot. Now, Q is a heating source, and we can take, you know, you can have radiation, you can have um, heat diffusion, that's Fourier's law, different forms. We'll give you that, we'll give you those forms um, as needed, but for work, um, you have also work done by, just similarly to the momentum equations where you had forces, surface and body forces, those forces are, are gonna do work. What's the definition of work? force times distance, right? What is then the rate of work? Force times distance per unit time, so force times velocity. Very simple, right? So then the total work done by the body force on the system is minus integral over the volume, so that's the entire volume, F dot U dV, right? Okay, so now think, say, think about this, you have, we have so many negative signs, right? So if this integral so if the work is done on, on the system, it needs to be positive, right? If, if it's done on the, on the body, it needs to be positive. And so we have a minus sign over here, and multiplied by the other minus sign over there, okay, that is gonna give you a positive sign for dE by dt. Same thing, work done by the surface forces. So these are surface forces. I know this is, this is a nightmare to track, um, all, all the negative signs, but if these are forces, if these are surface forces doing work on the surface, again, same thing, that's the stress tensor, tau, rate of work is tau dot u, because work is tau times distance, and then the rate of work is tau, tau dot u. Now remember, this is a tensor, right? So tau dot u is gonna be a vector, so tensor, vector dot n is just gonna give you a scalar, okay? And you substitute tau um, for its form. This is another way of writing the stress tensor in vector form, rather than writing tau ij, I wrote it in vector form and I said minus pi, i is the identity matrix. So that essentially is for only for the normal stresses you get a p-force, for the tangential stresses you don't. The point is, all of this is just to do the derivation. Once you write this in differential form, you get this really nice compact form d rho E zero by dt plus div u rho E zero. So you see repetitiveness here. For the conservation of mass, we had d rho by dt plus div u rho. For conservation of momentum, d rho u plus div u rho u. For conservation of energy, d rho E zero plus div u rho E zero. And then on the right hand side, you have the heating minus div q. Q could be related to the temperature using Fourier's law, for example, if you only have um, heat transfer, basic heat transfer. And then um, from the stress tensor, we extract the pressure. So that's the pressure work minus div PU plus div tau dot U. Again, tau dot U is a vector. Div is gonna give you a scalar plus F dot U, okay? Don't worry too much about the energy equation. 
It can take different forms. You see energy equation written in terms of temperature, in terms of enthalpy, in terms of internal energy, in terms of kinetic energy, in terms of total internal energy. We will deal with diff individual forms depending on the system you are dealing with, okay? And depending on the assumptions you make. I cannot do anything here without stating assumptions. Is this in a calorically perfect gas? Is this an ideal gas? Is this a real gas? What is the relation between the internal energy and the temperature? Okay, if I want to transform this into a temperature. So all of these conditions matter before you, s you split out the energy equation. In a way, it is one of the most difficult equations um, to actually derive and to deal with um, in, in fluid dynamics. Okay? But anyway, I just want to try to be done with this, with this, uh, this lecture. Summary of governing equations. Um, conservation of mass, the integral form. D dt integral rho dv minus equal minus integral of the fluxes of the density. Conservation form d rho dt plus div rho u. And convective form is when you split out um, this guy. The conservation form essentially says you keep everything inside divergence terms. Okay, All advective fluxes are kept, advective and diffusive fluxes are kept inside the di divergence terms. And we will also discuss why is there an advantage for using the conservation form versus the um, convective form or the non-conservation form. Yes, in certain cases there are. Okay. Um, for conservation of momentum, also again, two different forms. This is the conservation form and this is the advective form. So essentially what I've done to go from here to here, you split out this term and split out this term and invoke the continuity equation. So this guy is going to give you rho du dt plus u d rho dt. And this guy is going to give you um, u dot grad rho u plus rho u div u. So you combine d rho dt plus div rho u together and set them to 0. The problem with doing that is numerically, what if you're actually not satisfying the continuity equation? What if d rho dt plus div rho u has a small error? Doing this, assuming that it is zero, you're making a gross assumption. You're introducing even more error into your system. Okay, So the conservation form essentially keeps all errors in check. But it has different, uh, different benefits as well. OK. Um, when you look at equations of this form, I want you to think of them intuitively. Um, and identify three important terms. The time rate of change term, that's a transient term. Obvious, it's how things change in time, how things accumulate or is, are lost at a point. But I want you to always identify two important terms. An advection term, which we discussed earlier, that's a quantity being advected by a vector field. In this case, the vector field is the velocity field. And a diffusion term. So we said advection is when things move in the bulk. Okay, I'm going to blow at the instance and let it move. What is diffusion? It is what? With the bulk, it essentially relies on the motion of the. In so so you know particles in matter they're like hyper all the time. They're they're shaking. They're moving. They're bouncing around. Right, and as they bounce, they transmit information. Okay, and they to kind of share share everything. They love sharing. So if I come here and I heat this portion of the wall, the particles over here are going to get super excited, and they're going to start transferring the information to the neighboring particles until you know, way far away, they don't cannot access this information. So that's diffusion. Diffusion is when I light the incense and sit quiet and wait for the concentration of the incense to slowly be transported to you. Okay, that's diffusion. It happens at the molecular level. It relies on the funda Brownian fundamental motion of particles as they bounce and you know move around. So if you endow the particles over here with a certain property, okay, that being the concentration or a temperature, they're going to sense it and they're going to transfer that property to all the neighboring particles. So that's diffusion. Okay, and in the Navier-Stokes equations, in the momentum equations, it, ha it happens to show up in the um, stress term. OK. So now we're going to look at a few special cases. For fluid flow, the general classification is going to be 
compressible and incompressible. And boy, we're going to talk a lot about the differences between these two. Um, but just to kind of illustrate what is going to, what we're head, where we're heading towards, and this will be the first time we do this in the CFD class at the University of Utah, we're going to look at the Euler equations. So when you combine a compressible flow, so we take the full fluid flow equations that we saw, continuity, three momentum, and energy equation, and you kill viscosity. You take the viscosity out of the picture, so you simplify everything. You get what's called the Euler equations. And in addition, you assume you have an ideal gas, and so and a calorically perfect gas. So you have this ideal gas law and a relation between the internal energy and the temperature. You get these equations. You get you still have the continuity equation, d rho by dt plus d rho u by dt, d rho, uh, d rho u by dx, d rho v dy, d rho w dz. And then your momentum equations simplify like we've shown before, but also your energy equation becomes way simpler. You don't have any heating involved in it. You don't have any um, viscous dissipation going on. So you only have just inviscid action going on. So this gives rise to the Euler equations. They are compressible inviscid flow. That, those are the Euler equations. They have been instrumental in the development of our aerodynamic capabilities in the United States. So early flight, early development of um, um, high speed aerodynamics, all was built and was founded on the Euler equations. Okay? Incompressible flows, we said div u equals zero. But also, if you have constant density and constant viscosity, you get the Navier-Stokes equations. So the Navier-Stokes equations are only a special case where you have a constant density and, well, not necessarily constant viscosity, but they're still called the Navier-Stokes equations when the viscosity is constant. You get these equations. And they are written in um, convective form, non-conservation form. So you have rho du dt plus rho u dot grad u. So again, think of this as individual components. These are three equations, du, dv, and dw. Same thing over here. And then the stress tensor, or the diffusion term, looks now very similar to your diffusion equation. So what's the diffusion equation? For temperature, for example, dt by, yeah, you have a d squared, right? So you have, for constant, Diffusivity, diffusivity, you have K del squared T. That's a diffusion term, okay? And now you can see diffusion um, show up very clearly in a traditional chemical engineering form, okay? Del squared U, okay? Um, we will be dealing with this equation, these equations, um, okay, uh, for the most part. And also one more simplification. Um, we're going to be dealing with two-dimensional flows because doing simulations with Python on a 3D transient flow is going is to cost us a lot. So it would be best to just illustrate these concepts on a two-dimensional flow. So in 2D, these are the governing equations. These are the Navier-Stokes equations in 2D for a constant density, constant viscosity flow. Okay? Now the methods that apply here will apply to all the other equations. So if your viscosity is not constant, okay, or if your flow is not necessarily, div u is not necessarily zero. And we'll touch on that by the end of the semester, okay? Actually, this is my research area when div u is not zero, but you don't have fully compressible flow. So um, anyway, these are this is we will be dealing with this. And finally, a reminder of the, of the pressure. Um, so the pressure is an interesting quantity because once we go to, a, to an incompressible flow, if you notice, I got rid of the energy equation and I got rid of the equation of state. Because for incompressible flows, there's no relation between the density and the pressure. There's no, I, there's no equivalent to the ideal gas law. Okay, so we need a different mechanism to get the pressure. Okay, we still have. So in this case, we have u and v and p as unknowns. So we have three unknowns, and we have three equations. So the system is well posed, but we have to figure out how to extract the pressure from these equations. Okay, and this has been historically one of the biggest challenges for 
incompressible flows. But then the role of the pressure for incompressible flows is to combat dilatation. Okay? So for for uh, uh, there's a very complex uh, derivation that proves this. It essentially tells you that the pressure for incompressible flows acts as a as a um, enforcer of the constant density or dilatation equals zero uh, 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 condition. So if, again, if you look at the constant density or the incompressible flow equations, constant density, you have this dilatation equal to zero. So there's a complex derivation that shows that the pressure is the agent that acts to combat dilatation. So you will find that if you solve the Navier-Stokes equations without the pressure, you're not going to satisfy this condition. So those are just essentially advection diffusion equations. Without pressure, you can't satisfy this condition. So you solve them without the pressure, then you notice that there are points where dilatation is positive or dilatation is negative. Okay, so there is mass, you're losing or you're gaining mass. Then you add the pressure by a certain mechanism to enforce div u equals zero, and you will notice that the pressure is high when there is mass trying to come into a point, and the pressure is low when there is mass trying to leave a point. So the pressure is this enforcer of mass conservation for incompressible flows. Okay? And that's what I will leave you with. Next week, we will start with um, um, numerical methods. So we're going to start with the most basic method, finite difference method, okay? And we're going to try it out on a couple of model equations, like an advection equation or a diffusion equation, advection diffusion. But remember, this course is not about numerical methods. This course is about how to use numerical methods, what numerical methods to use to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. And what I'm leaving you with right now is, Okay, so we have three equations here, three unknowns, u, v, and p. But what is the equation for p? How the heck are, you gonna, are we going to extract p out of this? So the first method we're going to use is going to be called the vorticity stream function formulation. We're going to take these equations, we're going to rip them apart, and uh, get rid of the pressure, and try to solve for um, the velocity field. Okay? It has advantages and disadvantages. It's not practical for three-dimensional realistic flows, but it is one of the earliest, earliest papers, earliest studies to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. So we're going to do it for historical reasons and also because it works really well with the finite difference method. Okay? Then once we're done with that, we're going to go back to these equations and look at more robust um, formulations. Remember, CFD is not only about thematics, it's also about algorithmic development. So an algorithm would be, okay, how do we solve these? What are the steps to extract U and V and P? Okay. What are the steps involved to extract these unknowns? So that's, there's algorithms involved in it. And there's modeling, of course. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend.